Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. What's happening with AAM is that it's it's creating this push, right, for us to squeeze all of these technical sophistication into the next generation of miniaturized avionics, then that's going to have ripple effects across the industry, right, for larger vehicles, for original air mobility aircraft, uh, and for all of the flying robots that we want to build in the future as well. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Vertical Space. This is a great conversation with Josh Shu, the Senior Director of Strategy for Unmanned Aerial System and Urban Air Mobility at Honeywell Aerospace, where he leads strategy, business development, and M&A. Josh discusses how to increase access and utilization of the vertical space, advanced air mobility in general, autonomy, fly-by-wire, artificial intelligence, and use cases for AI, including defense. Listen also to how companies look to Honeywell to be the authority on avionics and integrated systems, to Honeywell's dedication and approach to advanced air mobility, and how Honeywell is innovating from a fresh slate with AAM, and how they want to pull autonomy forward. Ja also talks about the mega trends in advanced air mobility and avionics, needed ground infrastructure, as well as opportunities for our entrepreneurs, how Honeywell works with startups and investments being made in this space. It's a thoughtful, articulate, detailed, yet expansive discussion. A great podcast. Thanks, Ja, for joining us. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight, and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned, and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access, or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation, and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Josh Hsu is the Senior Director of Strategy for the Unmanned Aerial Systems and Urban Air Mobility at Honeywell Aerospace, where he leads strategy, business development, and M&A. Before joining Honeywell, Joe worked as chief architect for UAM Systems at Airbus, where he built operational architectures and business cases for UAM. He also held leadership positions at the RAND Corporation, driving its research agenda in AI, ML, and UAS, as well as autonomy. On the vehicle side, Joe has led UAS design efforts at General Atomics and has recently taught applied aerodynamics as adjunct lecturer at Stanford. Joe, welcome to the show, and please say hello to Luca. Uh, hello, thanks for that kind introduction, Jim, and hello, Luca. It's a real pleasure to be here. Welcome, John. Excited, Thank you. Yeah, excited to talk about how we uh, increase access um, and utilization of the vertical space today. Excellent. Ja, our first question that we asked all guests, is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? So we at Honeywell um, are dedicated to the UAM and AAM space, right? We formed this business unit just to focus on this area two years ago. And we have actually been at this for much, much longer even than that uh, to lay, lay the technical foundations of succeeding uh, in advanced aerial mobility and, and helping our uh, vehicle OEM partners build world beating aircraft. The thing that's kind of unique about what we're doing is rather than repurposing all of our technologies and systems for AM space, which is kind of going to be a misfit, we are rather innovating on the fresh slate and building dedicated system into this space, right? Whether that's our compact fly-by-wire system, really the, the heart of an electrified or distributed electric propulsion aircraft, our detect and avoid solution, our simplified vehicle operations interface and architecture, which again is enabling or going to enable operators with less training to operate UAM and allowing the industry to scale. So the one thing that, that, would, that I would say we're doing different and, and changing how we do business is to be really dedicated to, the, to this space and devising solutions that are dedicated uh, for AAM. And the reasoning is pretty straightforward. If we just take UAM as an example, right? We are in a very small form factor aircraft asking for high assurance, right? So SCV toll, very high level, one U to the negative nine, catastrophic failure, 
probability, something that's really more akin to commercial aircraft now shrunken down to a small vehicle form factor. We also recognize that weight, power consumption, system integration are all critical for this class of aircraft, right? So in a conventional aircraft, for every pound of payload, you need three pounds of airplane. Uh, for this class of aircraft, because it's taking off vertically uh, and relying on active lift for that process, it's, you know, for every pound of payload, it's five pounds of airplane. Um, so it's critical, I think, for all of those reasons to innovate on a fresh slate for this market. And how is this a different approach from uh, some of the other players that you're seeing in the space? Right. I mean, I think what we're seeing is a lot of interest in uh, taking something that kind of works on the general aviation side and then adopting it for the space because there's not the same level of commitment. There's not the same level of recognition that what it takes to win in this space, what it takes to enable operators is to innovate on the fresh slate. And I think relatedly, right, something that's that's in there that we're doing a little bit different. Um, and, you know, we've been talking a, a little bit about this with Jim uh, prior to the start of this conversation. It's the idea that we want to pull autonomy forward. A lot of our you know OEM partners and vehicle uh, companies out there, they're very focused on today, right? Getting vehicles in operation, getting vehicle certified. And that's critically important. And we're supporting those companies doing that, right? On the UAM side, we're working with uh, Lilium and Vertical Aerospace. On the uh, cargo side, we're working with Pipistrol, right? So we're definitely in the trenches with our partners there. But at the same time, we know that they're busy, right? They've got their hands full. And they look to a company like Honeywell to be the authority in avionics and integrated systems. And so it's contingent upon us to accelerate the autonomy vision, to really parse out what it is that we need in terms of autonomy from all of the noise, how to implement it natively in our systems, and how to deliver it ahead of schedule for them to enable the scaling of UAM capabilities. Luca, one thing we were talking about with the judge just before the, the show, which I'll share with the guests, we were talking about how some of our guests have talked about autonomy and steps, and some of our guests have talked about, you know, they're going to go right to the autonomous aircraft. How is Honeywell helping those mm -hmm. with those taking steps or those going all the way? How are you pulling that autonomy forward with your avionics? Well, there are, there are a few things, right? On the stepwise approach, we are very focused on delivering simplified vehicle operations in a way that's, that's simplifying pilot training. It's helping to mitigate the potential impact of pilot shortages on UAM, right? We want to make sure that we can have the pilot pool to scale the industry. And if you think about what SVO is, right, it's really about disintermediating some of the detailed aviating functions that the pilot does, right? Making the, the flight control much simpler, making the flight control interface much cleaner, and rethinking the partitioning between the, the flight control, in this case, the fly-by-wire system and the avionics to make sure that both are designed together to close some of the, the higher order functions and outer loops and to make sure that we have a very easy to pilot aircraft with full envelope protection. So in that sense, we're already making progress toward autonomy, right? By taking care of some of the mundane aviating functions. So that's part of the step-by-step -step strategy. At the same time, we're thinking, you know, we're building you know, avionics systems, fly-by-wire, actuation systems, and motors, right? How do we think of all of those systems in an integrated fashion to enable autonomy, right? So what are the functionalities that we should build into the avionics, into the flight planning engine, into the flight management system today to enable autonomous operations in the future? And how do we then recompose this, those capabilities to enable into an autonomy? Um, so tell us more about that. What do you, given the uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, at least on the regulatory front, to reaching full autonomy, how do you design your avionics today? What kind of assurances do you build into it to forge a path to autonomy? So for us, it's about taking the concept of op operations, breaking it down, and really you know, implement these autonomies in functions in pieces, right? And then tying it together, right? So rather than uh, treating autonomy as a sort of mystical thing where uh, a vehicle has agency and, and understands right or wrong, we're seeing it much more, you know, we just want to go from point A to B in a more automated fashion, you know, in a safer fashion. And, and to enable that, we see, you know, some core functions, right? Auto takeoff, auto land, uh, detect and avoid, the ability to do the necessary pre-planning and contingency management uh, for the autonomous flight, as well as some of the ability to react online, right? Either on vehicle or using a remote operations uh, station, right? So for us, it's really about, you know, breaking it down, which are the pieces we need to build and how, how do we build them into our avionics and flight controls roadmap that we're executing to now. 
Because at the end of the day, if you think about you know aircraft operating in, in semi-structured airspace environments today, in a fairly automated fashion, we do see that evolutionary pathway using what we're already tailoring into the UEM and AAM space to enable that future autonomy vision. And what do you think are some of the long poles in this challenge? Right. So you mentioned this, this question of assurances, right? Removing the human backstop does, I think, drive up ultimately the assurance level that's required on the vehicle, right? So the safety case must close on the vehicle. And that's why we see something like the compact fly-by-wire solution as an integral part of that high assurance autonomy. Uh, you know, fly-by-wire are some of the most high assurance systems today because, you know, central to the core flight control function, they cannot fail. They have to have very low rate of failure. They have to have very high availability, which means that that function has to be available and ready to go, you know, despite potential failures to one of those channels in the fly-by-wire system. So that kind of high integrity system and having the smarts to handle uh, autonomy and pre-planning and host those kind of functions, I think that's critical as a first step toward autonomy. So that's that's one example of how we're thinking about refactoring our systems to enable the autonomous flight uh, of tomorrow. So one thing that comes to mind, obviously, I think we're, we're talking here mostly about EV tolls. But if you move to some of the other UAS categories, a small cargo, large cargo delivery, what do you think the design assurance level of avionics is going to be required for those Right. That's yeah, exactly. Right. The there's going to be obviously variations. Right. I said earlier the concept of operations or conops. Right. There's going to be a lot of dependence on the concept of operations. Do you want to fly over a populated area? In, um, do you want to operate out of an airport or a more controlled environment? Right. Like a warehouse. Yeah. Is your vehicle you know large? Does it have a lot of kinetic energy coming coming down? Right. So all of those factors drive that decision of criticality once you've done the, the the safety hazard analysis, right? So at Honeywell, we have, you know, strong kind of strong experience in doing those kind of analysis with our OEMs and de- determining, you know, what is the right architecture for a particular use case. And what we're seeing in the space, obviously, on the small drone side, right, that's a, an area where innovation could uh, move faster, right? If we're operating a small vehicle in a remote area, over less population, then of course the the required level of assurance is going to be lower. On the other hand, if we're operating over a populated area with you know manned aircraft or a large cargo vehicles, then the the requirement will be will be quite different. You know what we see as as our expertise and and, and really value proposition is to enable that high insurance operation, you know, with large cargo vehicles, with UAM vehicles, and with the delivery drones that require that level of criticality and integration into the airspace. That's where I think uh, Honeywell adds real value. And are there any use cases that you can generalize and say, these will require Dal A avionics? Yeah, I mean, I think it's any time where human lives are significantly at stake, right, either on board, or if there's significant risks to people on the ground. So part of the reason why SCV toll is very keen on requiring very high level of assurance is the expectation that these vehicles will operate at or, or near urban centers and putting mm-hmm. people's lives at risk. We have a very you know safety oriented culture at Honeywell, right? We embrace the speed of innovation, particularly in this space. You have to, but we have to do so in a way that doesn't compromise safety. Right. And to what extent do you at Honeywell deploy AI self-learning adaptive systems into avionics? And if so, how do you go about ensuring determinism in these kinds of systems? I think we can take a step back uh, and, and think about the application, right? AI ML is, is kind of a, it's, it's a, obviously a, a vital part of our uh, economy today. Uh, it's also a fairly loaded word, right? We've overloaded the word substantially to mean a variety of different things. AI, right, includes both classical artificial intelligence, you know, decision systems, knowledge-based systems, good old-fashioned AI, right, knowledge representation. It also includes, obviously, uh, machine learning, which, you know, is anything where you feed it data to improve the system. And machine learning, of course, then subdivides into deep neural nets, right, connectionist systems, as well as traditional machine learning, SDDs and, and those kind of systems, Support, uh, support vector machines and those kind of systems, random forests and, and those kind of things. So uh, it's it's various different categories. And then we can think about within that taxonomy, how do they apply to, to aerospace? First and foremost, right, flying an autonomous aircraft, building the trajectories, building the flight plans, that's all kind of classical AI. It's path design, it's trajectory design, it's graph theory. And that has a lot of applications in both the kind of flight plannings that we do today and in any kind of autonomous operations. 
Uh, as an example, uh, Honeywell recently demonstrated our detecting the voice system, right, on a small drone. It's a radar-based system, uh, a small active array radar that allows the drone to see other drones and take measures to avoid them. That radar and that integrated system is driven by a path design, a, a rather a trajectory design algorithm that figures out how best to design the avoidance maneuver and rejoin the flight plan. So you can call that AI. And in fact, it is by sort of the classical definition of artificial intelligence and AI system, but it is not quote unquote, a, a learning based system. We're not providing feedback and gradients into the deep neural nets to tell, tell it how to evolve all of the param, you know, trillions of parameters in the neural net. That's not what we're doing. So I think the the story there is there's a lot that we can do with classical AI because, you know, we have good sensors and we have good problem representation and we have structure in the airspace to enable autonomy. Where does machine learning and deep neural net come into play are situations where we don't have a good representation of the problem, where creating that representation is time consuming and that representation evolves rapidly in time. And then it's also in a situation where we have lots of data, right? And that data can be readily validated and deployed into training the system. So I think when you think about AI ML, it's, it's really important to be careful about what is the application and you know where does different types of AI or ML deliver value? That's a good point. That's a good point. And you mentioned DAA as a, as a great initial use case. What are some of the other use cases where you see increasing autonomy uh, or machine learning being applied to? Right. So we definitely see on the market, right, machine learning being used for perception type applications, right? If you think about the, the architecture of some of these systems on self-driving cars, for example, right, it's, it's, it's different layers, right? The perception layer is really doing the state estimation, doing the slam, right? Understanding where the vehicle is, what's in the environment. And then there are planning layers that are probably more classical in nature, uh, reasoning through how the vehicle should then navigate the space once it's figured everything out. I think that model also works in aerospace, right? So you're going to see machine learning applications at the perception edge and then doing the sensor fusion. And then classical planning still has a role to play once you create that sort of a structured representation of the problem. Other applications, so that's that's one view. What we're seeing on the defense side, which is kind of very interesting, is that uh, machine learning being applied uh, more readily toward planning problems as well, whether it's supervised learning, semi-supervised, or in the case, kind of semi-supervised learning, which is reinforcement learning. I think, and having done some of this work previously at, at the RAND Corporation, I think the real opportunity there is, again, right, if the problem is hard to represent or hard to break down, then uh, reinforcement learning where you can learn on lots of simulations, right, whether it's self-play or, or just extensive simulations uh, to say, hey, if I tweak these parameters this way, my outcome is, is better. Right. And using that mechanism to devise rules and strategies to tackle a particular problem. Uh, and I think this is useful on the defense side because their problems can be quite complex, right, relative to a civil transport application where you're going from point A to B. On the defense side, it's really about, you know, how do I get from point A to B without getting shot down by an S-400? How do I do that while protecting my wingman? Uh, how do I do that? Why, you know, get a sensor data on on these these collection points that I need to do? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and that's a defense is a great uh, use case where the benefit really does outweigh the risk. And I'm sure there's other similar use cases on the on the civil side of the fence around emergency response uh, mm -hmm. or even you know low risk remote cargo operations. I'm sure there's others as well, but. Uh, but yeah, those are those are some interesting near term opportunities where where some of these technologies w could be put to test and use immediately. Yeah, exactly. And, it, you know, it's it's really about, you know, if, if there were some way to really measure the complexity of the task, right, in terms of both the volume of data, right, the, the lack of structure or the presence of the structure in the problem, or just the, the sheer number of functions that I need to compose together, right? So it's not just a transportation function, but to your point, maybe there's a ground element to cargo integration or search and rescue, uh, or in the military case, there's just different military functions, right? Different mission tasks that I have to perform and varying platform that I have to integrate in this sort of multi-domain context. So, that's why I think there's things that we can do today in civil UAA, uh, UAS and UEM that we can do without requiring, I think, radically new connectionist AIML technology. But there's also the potential in the future to expand the flexibility and context compatibility of our systems to use those, you know, adaptive systems. And, and to your point, right, with that comes 
the imperative to verify those systems and to figure out how to certify them. Joe, before we move off of AI and machine learning, let's say I'm an investor and I only invest in AI and machine learning. What would be an example today of where AI and ML has had the greatest value to advance their mobility? And in the next 10 years, what would you say is the biggest challenge that this investor who doesn't really understand advanced term mobility, what would you say is the biggest problem that has to be addressed mm -hmm. by AI or machine learning? Yeah, you know, to be quite honest, right, in the near term, uh, when you think about AI ML uh, applications, a lot of companies, uh, say for the few examples that we sort of talked about, wants to get a certification right away. I would argue that there's comparatively less AI ML uh, applied to those vehicles specifically. They may be using it in elements of their design, right? They may be using it in the kind of transportation analysis that they're doing, right, to figure out how to approach different markets. But in terms of the vehicle themselves, there's probably less direct applications there. In the medium term, I think it's going to be this classical AI application, right, and how to refine those to be able to do, you know, robust contingency management, right, to allow the, the vehicles to operate with, with a high level of practical autonomy. And let's not forget, right, just because deep neural nets are hard to verify, it doesn't mean that sort of deterministic software is easy to verify. In fact, why is software validation under the DL-178 framework so hard today, right? All of the process that goes into it, all of the work that goes into it, it is because software validation is, is a hard problem, right? We've uh, consolidated all of the complexity in there by definition. So some of the classical AI applications are also going to take quite a lot of work to verify and validate. And an investor would do well to think about, you know, how can they take advantage of that and how can they invest in companies that also enables that. And in the long run, I think there's plenty of opportunities for tackling more complex multimodal problems, right? Whether it's on the defense side, when you're orchestrating different vehicles, or maybe on the civil side, when you are aerial robots are collaborating with your ground robots are then also collaborating with people in the future. There'll be opportunities to do that. And if we step away from just the vehicle, right, there's also the, the airspace level. There's already quite a bit of research in thinking about how do I tackle the complexity of the, the search and optimization problem in air traffic management with a machine learning and AI ML approach, right, with reinforcement learning? I think that's an area where if you can compress that inherently MP hard type problem, non-polynomial problem, with, a, with clever machine learning, then th there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Let's step back and talk a little bit about what kind of trends you're seeing in the UAS avionics market in general. You know, the trend that we're actually really driving, right, we've, we've talked about this earlier of building segment dedicated solution, that really means compressing the sophistication and compute power of larger vehicles, of more sophisticated vehicles into the UEM four factor. So take, take, for example, the compact fly-by-wire system. You know, we've taken a, a fly-by-wire control system, which on a commercial aircraft could be the size of large bookshelves and cabinets weighing, you know, upwards of 800 pounds. We're really shrinking that into a form factor where the three boxes together is maybe, you know, 10 pounds or less. And then the, the physical dimensions are such that they're the size of hardware back novel. So the trend is really toward miniaturization and miniaturizing with a high level of capability, right? So the fly-by-wire system itself is designed for triplex redundancy with sophisticated voting logic. And it's also dissimilar, right? So the boxes are themselves designed and built differently uh, internally to allow for that level of um, statistical non-correlation, right? So that they don't fail in the same way. So what's happening with AAM is that it's, it's creating this push for us to squeeze all of these technical sophistication into the next generation of miniaturized avionics. And that's going to have ripple effects across the industry, right? For larger vehicles, for regional air mobility aircraft, uh, and for all of the flying robots that we want to build in the future as well. And outside of your work at Honeywell, what are some of the interesting things that you're seeing from, from other companies and other perhaps startups? And in parallel, what innovation opportunities do you think exist in the aviation market for entrepreneurs to go out and solve? Yeah, I think one of the areas that's really kind of interesting, and we talked about this, is as the as we're asking more of autonomy, right? As we're asking more of software, software verification and validation, uh, and verifying the the implementation of flight logic becomes really important, right? I think there's a lot more that can be done in thinking about how do we accelerate 
certification processes? How do we accelerate the production of uh, test artifacts and the organization thereof? How do we use formal verification to prove uh, certain functionalities? You know, that kind of platform to enable accelerated certification uh, is going to be key for implementing autonomy, right? We're seeing some exciting work in this space by startups. We ourselves are investing in this space. I think that's going to be something of critical importance going in the future. And, and by the way, that's not even just, you know, aerospace, right? That's across the board as machine learning and AI is, is getting into kind of the cyber physical edge, right? Not just a recommendation engine on Netflix, uh, which you could argue is, is mission critical, but now into things that drive around that move that has potential to do great good, but also has potential to, to, you know, put lives at risk as well. How much of this innovation that you're seeing, this opportunity, how much can be, can we expect to see incumbents lead the way versus startups? Who's, who's better equipped to spearhead a lot of these efforts? So at Honeywell, we work with startups, right? Um, you know, we, we are very keen to work with all of the players in the ecosystem. And as an example, right, of assuring critical systems, right? I think there is an opportunity for startups to really help all of the industries, right? Not just aerospace. When you think about surgical applications, when you think about fraud detection, right? Any other mission critical AI ML autonomy applications, that's a huge amount of demand, right? If, if someone can respond and pull, pull that demand and build a solution, we would be happy to, to leverage it. And so we see opportunities here for startups and incumbents to, to each have their role. Our advantage is our expertise in building mission critical systems and our dedication into the AM market. We don't re need to reinvent the mission critical systems that we have, but we need to continue to innovate and leverage what's done you know, everywhere to figure out how to certify and rapidly deploy the next generation of systems. So I, I think that's an example where you know, the industry can enable this kind of hybrid innovation, right? Incumbents and also startups. And how do you expect the avionics value chain to evolve or change uh, in advanced air mobility? Do you think that there, this is a window of opportunity for new entrants to come in? Yes, I, I think just by virtue of the, the scale of the opportunity and the fact that there are so many moving pieces, everything from the digital infrastructure to the, to the avionics, to the network systems, right? There's a lot of opportunities. If I were a startup, I think the, the question I would ask myself is, do I need to build integrated avionics? Do I need to take on that certification burden? Do I need to provide that whole integrated system? Or are there specific niches that I can fill today, right? Then be part of networked innovation to enable that that future, right? Um, so how, because so even, how, would you, how would you answer that question if you were an entrepreneur? It's an interesting one, right? I, I think, you know, where I would go is I would think about what are the really differentiated use cases of the technology that I have? And, you know, what's the application of this technology in the short term, right? Building this kind of a ramp. And then in the future, right, when UEM is at, at scale. Because I think to, to succeed in this space, whether it's, you know, you're building an airplane or a widget, right? It's really about how do I succeed now in the environment of regulatory uncertainty? You know, what are some near-term use cases that can appeal to get to early revenue? That tells half of the story, right? The first customer story. And then the, how do I, you know, address a sufficient market scale, right? And, and are there blockers to scaling my technology and my addressable market? So I think any kind of entrepreneurs would have to address both of that, particularly in, in a rapidly evolving and, and emerging area like advanced area mobility. And, and indeed, I think you see the companies that are getting funding, getting traction are the ones that can answer both of those questions. I think it's much the same way on the on the avionics and sort of system level uh, side of the industry as well. How much of the innovation that's occurring in avionics within Honeywell is dedicated to AEM? And how much is, is part of the innovation cycle in applying to traditional aviation? Where we think we have the greatest success is building dedicated systems for the segment. So... A lot of the technologies, whether it's DAA, fly-by-wire, some of the actual aviation technology that we're building, are really innovating on a fresh slate, dedicated to the segment, because the requirements are are specific. What is needed in terms of the performance, whether it's you know C swap, right, weight, cost, uh, power consumption, to enable vehicle OEM success is very stringent, right? And we have to think differently and build differently into the space. Those are some of the examples where it's fresh slate. We don't want to throw away all of the experience that we have, right? Which is how do you certify mission critical software and hardware? And how do you leverage all the best that we've done, for example, in core avionics, right? Integrated avionics into the space. 
So on the avionics side, we're building simplified vehicle operation, which again, innovation mm-hmm. on the on the fresh slate for advanced aerial mobility. But that avionics platform is built on the Honeywell Anthem system, which is our new generation of avionics that's designed for AEM, uh, but also for other segments. So I would say that most of what we're trying to do is dedicated, uh, but where it is productive and where it is meaningful, like, like taking on the connected Anthems platform, and then accelerating the innovation that we can provide in terms of simplified vehicle cooperation, we've also taken that path as well. I'm the CEO, let's say, of Honeywell. We're sitting back at a, in a management meeting and we're saying all this investment being made in advanced air mobility. You know, a lot of people would question how big is the market going to be, let's say, in 10 years? How do you convince the CEO of Honeywell this is a smart investment? Yeah, I, I just had a call with the CEO right before this meeting. <laughs> so <laughs> this is... This is timely. One of the things that we, we've really benefited of is, is high level support and commitment to this market, both the CEO of Honeywell Aerospace and also Honeywell CEO Darius as well, in supporting our effort. They see this as a long term bet, but they're also keen that we need near term validations and proof points in the market. Right. So I would say in the long run, the arrows, the kind of the motivation for advanced aerial mobility is very clear. We need to have new forms of transportation that alleviates congestion, that gets people to where they need to go quickly in an environment where cities are getting crowded, congestion is getting worse, and investment in basic road uh, road infrastructure is limited. The mega trend is in our favor. In the other aspect uh, of uh, cargo, right, we're seeing e-commerce experiencing continued explosive growth, right, 15% year over year over the last 20 years and 30% in the last couple of years uh, with that trend continuing. And same day delivery is becoming, you know, once once a differentiation is now kind of a consumer expectation. We see those mega trends as accelerating the need for new forms of vertical mobility, right? Whether it's passenger, cargo, small drone. And that combined, right, those those strong mega trends are the market signals and they present also multiple paths to victory. There's UAM, there's cargo, there's military, there's small drone. So all of those things depend in some sense on the core set, set of technologies that Honeywell can provide. So we see a robust positioning there. In the near term, I would say we're seeing continued significant investment into this space. If you asked me a couple of years ago, would I have expect, expected the level of invest, investment, right? 10, $14 billion, as well as the number of um, letter of intents and pre-orders for the vehicle to, to happen this quickly over the course of you know, really 12, 18 months, I wouldn't have expected that. So I think there's near-term validation. You know, there's a group of very smart people, right? Very smart companies working in this space, building prototypes, retiring technical risks, forging partnerships. And we're doing that with them. And then there's a long-term vision of multiple paths to victory, solving real problems for society. So I think all of those things combined forms the basis of our investment thesis. Avionics as a service is becoming somewhat of an increasing trend, and some argue that a significant part of functionality will be offboard and will leverage technology embedded ground infrastructure. One, do you agree with this viewpoint? And uh, and if so, is Honeywell thinking about going into the ground infrastructure business? So it's important to know that we already have elements of ground infrastructures in conventional aviation. We do things on the Air traffic management side, we do things on GBAS, right? Some of the uh, GPS augmentation systems on the ground to allow us to land airliners. So it's important to call to that body of experience uh, already. In terms of where kind of does the autonomy, where does the smart, where does the sensor reside? For certain types of vehicles, I think it'll there'll be a crossover point where ground infrastructure makes sense. When you have very high density operations, when you can rely on the on the integrity and availability of the data link, right? Those kind of are the key attributes. And then when you think about the, the mission risk and safety risk of, of operation that's involved in that particular case, can I always just, you know, kind of hit a panic button and say, return to base, right? And without really suffering any, any major consequences to canceling a mission. So that's one view. But we're of the view that onboard systems, autonomy and safety case is also very important for getting these systems into service. The regulators, the publics, you know, they'll need that level of safety closure at the at the edge, right, on the vehicle. And it also gives you a level of flexibility to be able to operate in environments where the communication infrastructure isn't maybe as, as mature or guaranteed. And in, in situations where we would need a high level of mission assurance, right, I don't want to cancel this cargo delivery 
anytime there's a communication problem. So from our vantage point, yes, there is an opportunity to enable ground infrastructure, but we see really the criticality of, of the system at the edge as well to enable flexible operations. Fair point. And you mentioned data links. Can you tell us about Honeywell's SATCOM data link for drones and how does it compare to existing SATCOM solutions and what class of UAS is it intended for? Yeah, so we have the small form factor, the Honeywell small form factor UAS SATCOM system. Uh, It's one of the smallest solutions on the market. So when you put the the module as well as the antenna together, it's, you know, less than one kilogram. So for a large class, I think, of drones and, you know, UAM and AAM type vehicles, it offers the opportunity to have a link that can transmit payload data, but that can also in the future enable command and control. So this SATCOM system is uh, is, de- is going to be deployed on the Pipistro Nuva 300 uh, cargo drone. It's a very heavy cargo drone that's designed to do point-to-point cargo delivery built by Pipistro, a Slovenian company with a rich pedigree in uh, electric and advanced uh, aviation systems. So in that particular use case, the SATCOM uh, and Fly-by-Wire, which is also supplied by Honeywell and other systems, work together to enable effective autonomy and, and remote operations. So that's kind of different kind of use cases, right? To enable surveillance and situational awareness by transmitting video uh, in a small form factor, and then also enable command and control for different classes of vehicles uh, to enable autonomy. So that's why we see that's that's a key product, both because of the unique form factor and capability that it brings, as well as the, the plethora of use cases that it can enable. In a recent uh, investor presentation, Honeywell mentioned that your pipeline was seven billion over the next five years, and fifty-four billion out to twenty thirty. What types of customers represent those opportunities? Mm -hmm. And that's only the pipeline. What's your confidence level? Or what kinds of capabilities would you sell to increase the confidence level? And then, lastly, what has to happen in the outside world, whether it relates to infrastructure and the like? for you to have a higher confidence of getting more of that pipeline? That pipeline is, is I think, overwhelmingly um, UAM and AAM vehicles, so heavy cargo. Also embedded in there are things like delivery drone systems, so our detect and avoid solutions, our GPS deny solutions, our small SATCOM solution would be in that bucket that applies for large and small vehicles alike. So it's all of those segments. And I think the fact that we can address those, diff- those different segments in some cases, with common systems, adds to the robustness of our strategy and execution in this space. To your second point, what has to go right? I think for for UAM, it's critical that we get to first certification in the next, I would say, you know, two or three years, and then we get to effective operations that are commercially relevant, that are giving time back to the traveling public, that uh, shows the ability to to scale. Right. So basically, what we need to happen is certification, and then for the industry to, to prove that it can deliver value. What enables that is to be able to fly high value routes. And so that then in turn brings up other kinds of things to solve for, which are you know things like noise, uh, community acceptance, the ability to work with local governments and municipalities to deploy vertiports and deploy these aircraft to where they're gonna, they're gonna do the most good. I think that's really the, the critical next step that we as an industry have to enable uh, to push this forward. From Honeywell's perspective, right, what we can do is to deliver safety critical systems, right, fly by wire avionics, propulsion systems, um, electric motors that are all certifiable, that de risks from a, from a vehicle OEM's perspective all the things that they have to do to get to certification and safe operations, to know that they can leverage uh, Honeywell and its, its experience, its 100 years of pedigree and safety critical aviation systems and the fact that we're on 98% of the uh, civil aircraft out there to be able to leverage that body of experience and our commitment to innovate on a, on a fresh slate in this space. So those are some of the critical things that, that have to happen. Joe, it appears that Honeywell is taking a strong interest in heavy cargo UAS. Is that because the current form factor of your avionics has the greatest fit with those classes of, of, of aircraft? Or is it because you think that the market opportunity is the greatest in that segment. We do see a real opportunity there, right? Because both from the angle of the economic potential of being able to really increase the utilization of pilots for middle mile cargo and also for the vehicles, right? To be able to kind of refactor that business with autonomy. We see a lot of opportunities there, but we also see the fact that that as a 
as a use case where we can modulate the risks a little bit, right? We can operate from maybe more a more controlled environment in some cases, directly from a warehouse to a warehouse rather than accessing a busy airport, for example. And then to be able to fly in some cases from a more remote area or less populated area rather than going from day zero to an urban environment with autonomy. So we see that it's those two elements, right? One is a strong business case and also the ability to modulate the risks of, of autonomy from the get-go. So we, that's why we, we think that's attractive. There's also a fit, I think, with some of our systems because what we're seeing in that segment is even, even though it makes sense to be able to modulate the risks and to operate initially from rural environments, the real business opportunity also means accessing those, those more complex airspaces and more urbanized environments. So what we're seeing is some companies really wants to both operate today in those simpler environments, but provision the vehicle systems to be able to operate in those high, higher requirement environments. That's a real opportunity for us to go in and say, look, you know, you can do this right the first time. You can certainly kind of operate in an environment where the regulations are still being developed, but to have a future proof system uh, with Honeywell on board. Mm-hmm. So staying on the uh, on the heavy heavy cargo drone space, do you have a sense of uh, the market opportunity in terms of volumes and vehicles in the near term? Right. So we've done some of this analysis internally using cargo data, publicly available in some cases, and transportation data of you know where where freight is going and in what volume. And you know, without quoting specific numbers, we think it's it's quite promising, right? Even if a small percentage of cargo which, by the way, the, the, the volume of parcel shipping is going up rapidly, right? But even capturing a, a small portion of that makes this a very viable market space. Yeah, I agree. I think n- not only is there an opportunity to take some of that ground movement and put it in the air and therefore increase flexibility of the entire network and optimization of that network topology, but I think there's an, a second order effect here where all of a sudden you provide this capability to people who didn't even think about having that right. capability within reach. So I agree with you. I think it is a, a massive opportunity. And, you know, it's it's also provides another lever to trade in terms of how many warehouses I have to build on the ground and the degree of pre-positioning that I have to do to enable same-day delivery. Uh, and if you ask the logistics players, that could be a pretty significant overhead. So, you know, to enable point-to-point delivery on demand, Using efficient aircraft is a way to really allow you to scale e-commerce without having mm-hmm. to really kind of kill yourself over fixed infrastructure, right? If you were a logistics provider or a logistics company, how easy is it for them to adopt this new technology into their existing processes and workflows? And what is it that we as an industry can do mm-hmm. to help ease that transition? You know, what I have seen is that there is a real gap in terms of the end-to-end system integration, right, uh, between the ground logistics element, right, how do you pack the cargo, you know, how do you do the loading, who's going to be responsible for that, how do you, you know, do all the paperwork associated with it. I think there's there's work to be done there to really integrate that and provide maybe services to make that seamless for the operators, right? And then, Conversely, if you can solve that and, and make the, the the vehicle operations relatively seamless, then you've enabled maybe whole new classes of operators to, to come into that space, right? Because now you're kind of agnostic to the modality, right? Exactly. The fact that it's a flying robot uh, to to kind of establish that connection. It's, it's really like, it's, it's maybe less of a material distinction to you, right? So I think there's real opportunities there. You know, we think about this quite a bit because bigger Honeywell has a lot of industrial automation capabilities, uh, warehousing uh, capabilities. And so uh, we think there's opportunities there for us to, you know, think about how do we connect the dot with our vehicle systems, uh, with our with our system and autom- industrial automation solutions to, to really enable the operator as well. I'm the CEO and I'm speaking to an investor conference, let's say at JP Morgan. Somebody asks me, what's the number one differentiator for Honeywell in the advanced air mobility space? It, it is our ability to build tailored system into this space and to provide a high level of system integration uh, for all of those systems that we're, we're custom building into AAM. Terrific. Hey, uh, just recently it was announced that South Korea's WP Investments, along with Honeywell and your previous investor Atlantis, are the main backers of a 170 million Series E funding round with EV tall aircraft developer Volocopter. Do direct investments in specific vehicles conflict with deploying technologies in competitive vehicles? We don't see it that way. So obviously we 
you know, our job at Honeywell, we, we don't build airplanes, right? Our job is really to enable the OEM operators and the operators, so the vehicle companies uh, and the UEM operators, to make sure that they can build world-beating aircraft and world-beating services. So we have made investments uh, into different vehicle companies, and the reason for that is is to to help enable the space, to help enable those companies, and we make those investments not so much, really not on in terms of just making a financial return, but from the perspective of of a strategic partnership, and in some cases, really as part of the commercial package, right? So think of it another way, right? We do what we can to help our customers, right? For some customers, it's you know joint development of technologies. For others, it's making an investment to help them lever that into additional capital. From my perspective, it's really what do we do to best serve our customers, not to say putting a bet behind a certain company over the rest of the industry. So if you fast forward five or 10 years, what does the industry look like? First, I, I want to be able to take one of these vehicles. That's that's objective number one. Um, we want to see the, the maturity, growing maturity of simplified vehicle operation, of autonomous operations uh, in this space, really scale operation for advanced aerial mobility. I want to see different modalities of AAM, right? You know, there's the urban use case, there's cargo use case, also regional air mobility. Right. As I was telling Luca recently, I was in um, in Central Europe and in South Europe. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's really hard to get from a, a smaller place to another smaller place. Right. It, it just the amount of flying or train that you have to do to, to make that work is is exhausting. So to be able to connect different regions, whether it was a UAM platform or a RAM platform, that would be radically transformative. And if that's not enough, I want all of those things with a sense of normalcy, that it's not just exceptional to be able to fly these airplanes. Rather, it's, you know, it's on my app. You know, what I do with a car or a train on the app today, I want to be able to do this for, for this type of vehicles, that it's not, a, it's not an exceptional experience in the sort of ceremony of it without removing the, the wanderlust of flying. And what advice would you give to entrepreneurs or somebody who wants to start a business in advanced air mobility? I think most crucially to be able to deliver a service that makes sense and also to be able to gain the kind of investment to make your product real. Uh, I go back to the previous point. It's how do you find the way to win now, getting the first customer, getting to revenue in an environment where there's regulatory uncertainty, there's infrastructure uncertainty. And then how do you then win later when you have reached scale? How do you scale? How do you tap into the most valuable and the largest segments? Right. So it's really about doing both of those things simultaneously and thereby securing the value of your product and the investment that's needed to, to get there. Joe, what's the most common misconception or misunderstanding on the topic? Or I'm going to add one other thing. What technology has to occur or be implemented for this to be successful that people are ignoring? I wouldn't say ignoring, uh, but I think something that doesn't get enough play is that is the mission critical systems, right? All of the things that we talked about, the fly-by-wire the avionics, the detect and avoid, the actuation, the motors, all of the guts, right, that doesn't show up in glossy CGI renderings or prototypes sitting on uh, the airfields. And I, I say this partly with a keen awareness. My background is actually in aircraft design, so I'm, I'm very keen on those glossy uh, vehicle configurations. But the fact that I've worked at Honeywell gave, you know, gave me really this appreciation that the brains and muscles are very, very important. And that doesn't get enough play in some cases, right, in industry events. And, you know, when we think about AM, right, it's always kind of the visuals of the vehicle. But it's really those mission critical systems that's needed to, to reach the safety level that we're going to need to be able to operate this to convince the regulators and more importantly, the public, right, to accept this as a new form of transportation. So I think that's critically important. And, and I'm really grateful that we have this chance to talk about some of these technologies today in this forum. And that, uh, Luca and Jim, that you guys have done your homework on the avionics and integrated system side of things. Well, you're an impressive uh, representative for Honeywell, and it's uh, it's been great speaking with you. Luca, anything else from you? No, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for uh, finding time and being on the podcast. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Jim. Uh, really appreciate the excellent you know level of engagement and the, the really intellectually stimulating questions that you bring to the table. So we ought to do this over over coffee one day as well. <laughs> totally. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Josh. All right. That's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss. And goodbye until the next episode.
Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned, and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The vertical space makes no guarantees, warranty, or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.